thank you very much um, for that warm welcome and thank you very much to the organisers for inviting me to give this paper. It's a great pleasure to be here at this uh, Heads of Planning Conference. It's a great pleasure to be back in Pollock Halls where I was once a student here many decades ago and many exciting things happened in this hall of which I am not going to relate. <laughs> So, the brief that I've been given is to talk about the challenges of collaboration. As a former civil servant in the Scottish Government, or Scottish Office as it was, and now as a criminologist, I think it's been very interesting to observe over the past 30 years or so um, how collaborative intent has been repeatedly written into policy documents and also public services review. It's been formulated variously as things like inter-agency liaison and cooperation in the 1990s, uh, multi-agency partnership working in the, the noughties, and now in the second decade of the 21st century as co-production and co-design. These are sort of concepts that are coming to the fore. But it's also been interesting to observe how often such collaborative intent has been confounded in practice. Indeed, the evidence suggests that collaboration is fundamentally difficult to do and often, but not always, marked by a history of failure. So you've got quite a big challenge on your hands. So, in responding to this brief, I'm going to suggest that this failure notwithstanding, collaboration between institutions has become more vital than ever, primarily because of the fast-moving developments in data, digital and artificial intelligence, DDI for short, which characterise our age. These developments have been described by some commentators as marking a fourth industrial revolution. Others, such as Ian Golden from um, Oxford Martin School, have argued that they are more properly understood as a second renaissance. The scale and scope of the change is so dramatic. It's utterly transforming the ways in which we encounter and understand social phenomena. And this has profound implications for the ways in which knowledge is produced pervaded, communicated and consumed, and more particularly for the ways in which governments, both local and national, think, act and are held to account. Now, some commentators lay emphasis on the far-reaching social, economic and cultural uh, benefits that these advances might procure, heralding this new golden age of leisure for some. Still others highlight their dystopic possibilities, structurally redundant populations, whole generations literally innovated out of work, mass surveillance and loss of privacy, unregulated tech conglomerates and manipulated electoral processes. So in this paper, I'm going to argue that to realise the promise of data-driven innovation for society and mitigate against its darker potential, that there is a need for greater and more effective collaboration between a broader range of players, including universities, governments, industry and the wider community. But, as I will also suggest, the capacity for collaboration among such groups is often circumscribed by variations in working cultures and practices, the different mechanisms by which institutions are held to account, and by the challenges in constructing genuinely inclusive, empowering and co-productive modes of community engagement. Now, the paper is divided into three main sections. In part one, I'm going to explore some of the research evidence as to why collaboration is inherently challenging, and I'll be speaking to some things that I think you will intuitively know and have been talking about today. In part two, I'm going to examine in more detail the reasons why collaboration between institutions and communities is needed now more than ever, with two key exemplars linked to multiple deprivation at the area level and multiple morbidity at the individual level, two research themes that we are going to be taking forward in the Edinburgh Futures Institute. And in part three, I'll give an overview of the Edinburgh Futures Institute, which commits the University of Edinburgh to find new ways of joint working with external partner, partners. And in in doing so, we aim to form a kind of crucible within which effective collaboration can be forged. We are putting ourselves at the service of you and at the service of the wider community. The paper then concludes with some reflections on the purpose of the values of the 21st century university and a provocation for you here today. Can we all transcend our institutional silos and collaborate in a democratic spirit to build a more inclusive society? Everyone in this room has a role to play. Universities have a role to play. Can we actually do this together and what would that mean? Most of my examples in this uh, talk are come from criminal justice or criminology because I am a criminologist and I would. Um, but I'm sure that some of the problems I'm, I'm going to talk about actually also relate to other sectors and other elements of public policy. So that's the structure of the paper. On then to part one and why collaboration is challenging. 
So I've got a lovely little map here of how, how we've talked about collaboration in different ways over different policy time phases. So it's changed over time with each new phase in this sort of this, this, um, these sets of changes, pointing to efforts to be deeper, closer, to have more meaningful relationships. It's a bit like a, akin to a love affair, I think. It begins with talking about liaison, and then it goes into a bit of partnership, and then it's about co-production. So it's kind of a bit like a love affair. So that's how it's, it's changed over time. Now, there's a large body of research evidence now which has highlighted the challenges of early forms of modes of, co of collaboration, such as interagency liaison and partnership working itself, some of which I'm sure you will have already touched on, I think, in your deliberations today. But these are things, I think, that are fundamentally problematic about our approaches. So these include the variations in institutional working cultures themselves and their practices, and these kind of variations can lead to a lack of trust, a lack of understanding, a lack of common language with which to frame policy policy problems and potential solutions. For example, in my own research, when I was evaluating the implementation of the national objectives and standards for social work criminal justice services, very um, slick policy term there, in the early 1990s, interagency liaison was seen as the big thing, the big thing that would really make a difference. And the aim was to improve the quality of alternatives to custody, to um, persuade sheriffs that they should send fewer people to prison. Um, the potential of this policy to impact imprisonment rates was disrupted by the complete lack of trust between local and central government over strategic planning, over key, key performance indicators, and by the different values and world views of social workers and the judiciary. And so instead of imprisonment rates going down immediately after policy implementation, they actually went up. So it had the kind of complete opposite effect as to what was wanted. Further impediments to effective collaboration relate to the power dynamics between um, institutions. As my colleague Alistair Henry found in his research on community safety partnerships in the early post-devolution years, inequalities in terms of resources, in terms of personnel, in terms of experience, and inequalities in terms of capacity and resource between members of these partnerships significantly impacted their ability to work together. And these power differentials resulted in partnerships being dominated by particularly charismatic individuals or by the resource-rich institutions such as the police. And finally, researchers found barriers to effective liaison and partnership working posed by different ways in which institutions gather, use, um, store, share data. And this is actually still a fundamental problem. Even today, it's actually nigh on impossible to track cases through criminal justice systems, to track them through social care, to link social care with criminal justice. It's almost impossible to do that. So we've got real problems in terms of data linkage and data usage. So in spite of a recognition that working together is sometimes important, effective modes of collaboration have actually been somewhat elusive. And as a means of addressing earlier shortcomings, more recent thinking has turned to models of collaboration predicated on co-production and co-design. So co-production aims to uh, break down the power differentials between institutions and it aims to address some of the problems of the older modes of collaboration and hence build more democratic modes of engagement. And it aims to enhance participation through engaging, mobilising and empowering the hardest to reach groups. But research suggests that effective co-production, if this is what you want to embrace, particularly around community planning, it actively requires authenticity, so a real commitment to this process, not any cynicism that this process may or may not work. It involves listening, listening to people, listening to other groups. It involves trust. It involves time, time to build relationships and time for re reflection. It also requires critical friendship, being able to listen to criticism of self and respond in a positive way. And that's not always easy for institutions. And it also involves a distributed mode of leadership. As it says in this slide, mobilizing consensus around a vision, empowering individuals to take responsibility for elements, working, the, the working of the team is everyone's responsibility. So if you can get that mode of distributed leadership working, then co-production should be uh, effective. Importantly, co-production also opens up for the very first time space for academics to become more involved as active partners in policy development and delivery. The academy is wanting to be involved and it wanting to be a critical friend. 
What then does research suggest about co-production's likely prospects for success? Well, as I'm going to demonstrate quite quickly, um, it faces myriad challenges from the way in which governments, third sector organisations, communities and academics themselves function. And I'll go through these rapidly in turn. Quite a lot of wordy slides, I'm afraid. Well, first of all, impediments to co-production, how governments act. Well, do governments listen effectively? Hmm? Do they have time? Not very often. Governments can be very resistant to critical friendship. They often um, invoke evidence, research evidence particularly, to support positions already taken rather than criti critically engaging with ideas. Um, governments, do they show leadership? <laughs> Any leadership at all would be good. No, do they show leadership? Are they able to develop a model or in their, their practices in terms of distributed leadership? There are big questions about that. Governments constantly renew things. There's constant churn within government. And all of those kind of dynamics make it very difficult to develop a co-productive ethos and a co-productive set of ideas. In terms of third sector agencies, um, research suggests that such agencies often don't have the time or the capacity to collaborate, don't have the resources to collaborate according to a co-productive model, not least because they are under big financial constraints. There's also some evidence that they lack trust in other players, especially in a context where their longer term financial stability and security are dependent on government contracts and people that they need to be collaborating with. So there's a big issue around that. And in terms of communities, a key impediment to co-production lies in the lack of distributed leadership. There are big questions as to who or what constitutes legitimate representation of communities and big concerns about the difficulties of consulting hard to reach groups such as young people, those experiencing homelessness, asylum seekers and travelling communities. And finally, academics. Well, here there is a declining legitimacy of experts that we as academics are having to face. And I think that's one of the consequences of the Brexit debate is that there's been a decline in trust in academics when we were seen often as neutral, uh, neutral arbiters and brokers and translators of knowledge and before. And I've got a, a, an example here that Susan McVie and I uh, became uh, seventh in the Daily Mail's league table of 22 academics who state the bleeding obvious. So that's where we were. We're a bit cross about not being number one on that list. Uh, so being seventh seemed a bit in for a dig. But th that is a kind of indication of this erosion of trust and confidence in public institutions and in, in academia. So there's a declining legitimacy of confidence in public institutions. And academics too have limited time. They have huge pressures on them in terms they've got to navigate and balance workloads. Often people think that the academia is a kind of you just lounge on your seat every day and you write a few articles and teach a few students. It's not like that. There is a tremendous pressures on academics in terms of how we are assessed and how we are held to account. So the research excellence framework is something that really shapes what we do and it is a big driver. So that is why collaboration for us is also inherently challenging. So for all of those, all of these groups who might be involved in a co-productive ethos, there are major challenges to actually being able to participate effectively and do it effectively. So if we are going to co-produce, we need to think about how we give time, how we get time to listen and how we have time to be able to develop um, the distributed leadership needed. So on then to part two, and why collaboration um, is more than ever needed, even though it's more, you know, immensely difficult to do. Why is it more than ever needed? Well, the short answer to this is that some of the biggest policy challenges we face, challenges that uh, data-driven innovation might illuminate and solve, challenges which data-driven innovation itself might throw up, they can be characterised as wicked problems, and wicked problems cannot be solved by single institutions in isolation. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the concept of wicked problems, but I just to remind you, I put up um, his grint, um, his typology of the problem of problems. So remembering that wicked problems sit across and between government departments, there's often no stopping point at which the problem is actually solved. And even when you're trying to solve it, sometimes your solutions become other problems. Efforts to address wicked problems do require distributive leadership, one in which, in his words, Grint's words, ask the right questions rather than always seeing to, seeking to provide the right answers. And he contrasts, Grint contrasts these with two other types of problems. The tame problem, in which there's only a limited degree of uncertainty in how to proceed. There is always an answer, and where such problems can be resolved through things like unilinear acts in a single institutional framework. And leadership in this context is often characterised by management through 
process. And then finally, these critical problems which arise in the time of perceived crisis, where there is limited time to react, there's no uncertainty, the answer's needed now, and leadership takes the form here of command. Now, I've added at the bottom of this a further category to Grint's typology, that of what I'm calling sticky problems, which form, I think, probably a subset of wicked, so wicked and then sticky in the middle of that. And sticky problems are characterised by major consistency over time. That there are, there are stopping points within these problems, but these stopping points are then recursively reproduced. Efforts to solve sticky problems often fail to see the problem holistically and tend to focus on one constituent element. For example, um, if, if we know in our study that there's a very strong relationship between crime and living in poverty, but uh, instead of thinking about the, the, the criminal justice, thinking about how do we tackle poverty, we think about tackling crime so that poverty doesn't get addressed and crime does. So it's seeing the problem not in its holistic state, but as, a, as a one manifestation of it. So that's the nature of wicked problems. And I want to move on, sort of change pace a little bit and just show you two exemplars that stem initially from my own research about wicked problems, but which are the starting point of some studies that we're going to be taking forward within the, um, within the Edinburgh Futures um, Institute. And the first of these is continuities in the spatial dispersal of multiple, de multiple deprivation or across Edinburgh City. So I don't know if you're any, how many of you are from Edinburgh. Um, you might not recognise this map, but this is actually the city of Edinburgh. And it's been divided into 91 neighbourhoods. Um, and these neighbourhoods are ones that we have identified within our study, uh, the Edinburgh study, which has followed a cohort of 4,300 young people in Edinburgh for 21 years. So we're in our 21st year this year, for 21st year this year. And they are the, the neighbourhoods that young people identify with. And what we find in our study is that the social deprivation, multiple uh, contexts of social deprivation, that everything that we have in our study that is a negative feature of a young person's life actually concentrates on the areas of highest um, uh, social deprivation. And that these maps, which I'm sure you will kind of recognise the areas if you're from Edinburgh, they haven't changed for decades. So there's a continuity here, there's a real sticky problem here about how do you, how do you tackle this in the round. So this, this map here shows um, six indicators of social stress from the census data. And as you can see, there's a kind of pentagon shape on that map, which is the highest areas of social stress. So there's a pentagon area and then a bit in the middle. So that's, that's social stress. If we then move to police recorded violent crime, when we um, superimpose that on those areas, again, there's a very dark area in the middle, but again, you can see that pentagon shape beginning to emerge. And police recorded violent crime is both a measure of police activity, but it's also, crucially, um, a measure of victimisation, violent victimisation. Incivilities observed by our cohort, that's things like burnt out cars, needles in the street, graffiti and vandalism. Again, although it's a bit more dispersed across the city, again, it kind of concentrates in those areas. School exclusion, this is, sorry, I've just put some dots on this map. I haven't properly decoded this, so it's a bit blue petery, this one. Um, but school exclusions, very interestingly, um, also um, link into those areas. And we in, in actually modeling what best predicts school exclusion, coming from an area of a high neighborhood deprivation is one of the best predictors of who gets excluded from school even when you control for a volume of bad behavior so there's something stigmatizing something about area and something about the willingness and less tolerance of schools in those areas to tolerate bad behavior that is, it is evident across this map so school exclusion is on those areas and again this is something I think you'll be very familiar with is that detention young people who end up in prison in our cohort again they come mostly from those areas of the highest deprivation so multiple deprivation deprivation, something that's existed over time, all the negative things are happening within those areas and somehow or other, no matter how much inward investment, no matter how much entrepreneurialism, no matter how much community activism, those areas have been sticky. They've not really changed over time. Now what's quite interesting is thinking about that as a research problem, about how do we actually move the conversation forward with these. And one of the things that um, we've been looking at is um, areas where we know that there has been a big transformation, an economic shock, and understanding more about what's happened in those areas and other things from those areas that we might be able to learn, that we might bring into those Edinburgh conversations. So um, I, I commissioned um, Edina in, in Edinburgh University and Andrew Holm and James Crone particularly 
to do some modelling using the indicators of social stress in the census data on Newton Grange as an example. And that, that shows you, and the map on the left-hand side shows you where all the mining communities were in, in Scotland, and they've all gone. The entire, it's an entire industry that's completely gone. And the mine I want to focus on is Midlothian, uh, the Newton Grange in Midlothian, the Lady Victoria Colliery, uh, named for his wife by the Marquis of Lothian. I'm sure she was delighted by that honour. Um, and Newton Grange is the village that grew up around that mine. And the three pictures I've got there are sort of before, you know, before, during and after the the shock of the, the mine shutting in 1981. So lovely steam train, devastated station, now a nice new brand new station. So in terms of the mapping that we've been doing, um, it's actually quite difficult to compare census data across time over decades because they change the measures sometimes. But we looked at, um, and we, we disaggregated some of those indicators of social stress. But if you look at the map here, 1981 was when the, the mine shut. And there was high levels of unemployment. So darker areas are higher levels. So dark areas, high levels of, um, of unemployment. And as you can see, that over the last 20 years, the, in census data terms, that that level of unemployment has diminished. So there is actually much less unemployment in those areas. Similarly, with social housing, the quite high concentrations of social housing in the north area of Newton Grange. And again, that has diminished over time, although there still is some concentration in that top area. And then in terms of overcrowded households, again, that has diminished over time. So what's happening in that area? What might it tell us about community resilience? What it might tell us that a spanking new railway will mean that people will move in and colonise an area, and the middle classes will move in into cheaper housing and colonise an area. What's happened to the community? So um, there's something really interesting about how mining communities adapt and survive or not in the context of major economic shock. So what we're trying to do um, is bring together disciplines right across the university that might never have thought about these problems. We're beginning with um, a listening to communities project where we're training students to take stories and going out to some of these areas and getting the students to take people's stories about their understanding of the area area, their sense of identity. We're then going to be doing this transdisciplinary scoping and then hoping to come out and bring in the wider world, the so governments, third sector industry into conversations about this and then working with communities to see what, what it is that we might be able to transform or not. So this is actually a very ambitious project which we need to be doing all together and um, I'm hoping it's going to form one of the major platforms for the Edinburgh Futures Institute once we, we get going. The second um, problem I want to just talk about very quickly is, is um, multimorbidity across the life course and this is at the individual level and here I have a story from the Edinburgh study a woman called Doreen not her real name obviously and one of the things that's interesting about Doreen's story is that she um, is ends up in prison by the age 24 she has had a multiplicity over her life of trauma and difficulty Agencies have not generally been very aware of what that trauma and difficulty is because we know what she tells us and, the, and we know what the agencies record about her. But what's very interesting about Doreen is that from a very traumatic early experience of sexual abuse, she begins to be, it, the attention of agencies is caught because they think she's being neglected by her parents. And that neglect and child protection case gradually morphs into uh, the agency seeing her as a troublemaker and as actually an offender. And this is a hugely woman with multiple vulnerabilities. The agencies have failed her at every single stage. They don't talk to each other. They don't understand in, in the round what her problems are, right at certain time points and right over time. It's actually a complete concatenation of failure and actually rather depressing. And what her story demonstrates for us is that this is how agencies deal with her. She's in the middle and agencies deal with her like spokes a spoke and the hub uh, model so the agencies don't talk to each other what is needed is that where agencies see the problem in the round and more particularly when we're thinking about both multiple deprivation and also multi-morbidity through the life course this is this is what we need. This is a model which shows child development actually when, um, and it shows what it's meant to say, speak to, is the way in which each of these layers in these things that surround the child, each of them interacts with the other, each of them creates path dependencies with the others, and each of them has some kind of impact on that child's development. So unless we think of area level problems, policy level problems, uh, meso level problems, and locally and child centred area problems together and think about their effect on each other, then we will actually not solve problems, neither of multi 
morbidity nor of multi-deprivation. Multi it's seeing how each of these layers impacts on the other, taking more holistic approaches. That's enormously difficult and it's enormously challenging and it requires tons and tons of collaboration. So let me briefly go on to the final part of my paper and the Edinburgh Futures Institute and this our commitment to new ways of working. So Edinburgh Futures Institute is going to be, um, as David was saying, in the old Royal Infirmary. We've got some very high level statements about what we're trying to do, big vision about transfusing wisdom, knowledge and understanding, promoting human flourishing and supporting humanities to navigate complex futures. And my role as director is actually to translate all of that into very practical action. And our first major set of programmes is linked strongly to the Edinburgh and South East uh, Scotland City Region deal. And as part of that, it's all about the data-driven innovation programme, realising it's the benefits of DDI, mitigating against its negative possible impacts. What's distinctive about what we're trying to do is completely different for the university, and actually it requires re-engineering the university to some extent. Uh, we're trying to be challenge-led, so we don't start within academic disciplines. We start with a challenge, with a problem. We want to be applied, we want to have real-world impacts. And we're using data, digital and AI as both a mode of research, a way of doing research. It also is a site of research, an object of our inquiry, so we're looking at it as an object of research. And also we want to use data-driven innovation as an effect, as an impact of research to try and drive more innovative solutions. It's about radical transdisciplinarity at scale. So as I said, bringing disciplines that might never have worked together. So bringing arts, humanities, social science with natural science, medicine, uh, veterinary medicine, engineering, data science and it's acknowledging the complexity of the problems we face, the wickedness of the problems we face, and embracing experimentation. It's partnering with communities, with industry, with government. We are very keen to co-produce research and education. Everything we do, we commit to being co-produced in terms of research and education and offer critical friendship. It's about a genuinely lifelong educational offer. We are thinking now about a 100-year life and why, why should your relationship be with a university for 18 months when you come to do a master's or for four years if you come to do an undergraduate programme? Why not think you might come in and out of education? Sometimes not finishing degrees, but being educated over your whole life course. So we'll have undergraduate, postgraduate taught, up to executive education, open learning and access programmes. So that's our very strong commitment to education. And then the building itself is a fantastic fantastic opportunity for us. There's going to be this kind of synergy between what we're trying to build intellectually and the physical forum of the building itself. It was built along Florence Nightingale lines to avoid contagion. We're stripping the building back inside and the aim is to create contagion, to have encounters with different disciplines, to bring partner institutions in to work with us, with us, with us for a while, to have secondees coming in and out with us, us going out elsewhere. We have, we're going to have lots of creative maker spaces in it, we're going to have community gardens, we're going to have a creche. It's going to be, I hope, absolutely fantastic and an asset to the city. I feel very strongly that the university has made a big civic commitment by purchasing this building and we want it to actually pay back to the community. It doesn't quite look like that just now, that's kind of how it looks. It's a little bit um, bare, it's had quite a lot of rot in it. Literally in the bottom picture on the right hand side, little white dots, they were literally mushrooms when I took that photograph. Um, so we've got quite a bit of work to do, but it is an absolutely fantastic opportunity opportunity. We've got lots of eye-watering targets to meet for the city region deal. We've got five major programmes of research and innovation being begun now around ethics, and which is absolutely vital. I mean, ethics and, and um, the, the ethics of data and artificial intelligence and ethics and integrity are vital to everything we do. Creative tech, gov tech about public services, fintech and financial services, and then future infrastructure about how we build future cities. Um, and we've got a, a lovely project going on the actual building itself, somebody's doing some action research on this, the circular economy within the building itself. So that is Edinburgh Futures Institute. The um, motto at the top of the door on the lintel, it says, Patit Omnibus, it's literally set in stone, and that means open to all. And it's quite ironic that it's open to all and it's in Latin, but anyway it is. And that's the ethos in which we really want to work. We're open to all and we're open to working and collaborating with others. So my very final thoughts, concluding thoughts for you. I've put some couple of quotes up here that I think are quite important in terms terms of what we stand for. I think in these fast-moving and turbulent times, universities do 
even though people have lost a bit of trust in, in the legitimacy of experts, um, I do think that universities form an important source of continuity. And those quotes there were written about 100 years apart, one by Patrick Geddes, who will be well known to you, and one is Derek Bock, who was a former president of Harvard. And both of them speak to the way in which universities should be using their resource uh, to work with wi the wider community for the benefit of all. So a really kind of civic notion, the civic notion and purpose of the university. At the Edinburgh Futures Institute, we are pledging ourselves to an ethos of openness and an ethos of, of co-production and design. Our doors are open and we want you to visit. We want to reach out to external partners um, to shape the insights and the innovations that are needed, I think, to realise the myriad benefits of the new technologies and make sure we mitigate against their darker potential. And I want to end by returning to that provocation which I started the paper is, can we together transcend our institutional silos and collaborate to build a more inclusive society? Well, I think with genuine democratic engagement and intent and the offer of critical friendship, I think we can, I think we must, and I very much hope that the Edinburgh Futures Institute will. So thank you very much for having me today.